Good morning. Uh, let me just give you one encouragement. As you see, um, summer's over. And people come back to church, which is awesome. We love it. And by the way, I just want to say, to kind of help, I rode the shuttle today for the first time. It's not that bad. Just going to tell you. You know, Brother, Brother, David, <laughs> Brother David used to say, you're going to go to heaven. You're going to say, why are you here? I, a lion ate me to death. Okay, wow. <sighs> Would you sacrifice? Got my head lopped off by Nero and Rome. Wow, why'd you get here? I rode the shuttle bus at, <laughs> from beach. You know, no, I was like, it's not a big, it's not a big deal. So if you could help us, I'm asking you to consider parking there, riding the bus. If you live in Goodlettsville or White House or Greenbrier or Springfield, no, no brainer. Amen. You get out, you'll get out uh, pretty easy. And if you're in the chapel, we welcome you today. If you're joining us online, one of our prisons uh, around the country, we welcome you. Uh, today we're continuing through Revelation. We're going to ask the question: What would you rather, ruin? or repentance, ruin or repentance. Now, instead of covering, I told you this last week, but instead of covering every single detail from chapter eight and nine, and believe me, there are a lot of details there and we can get in the weeds. What I wanna do is I wanna take a larger approach, kind of a bigger 30,000 foot, and by the way, when we get to, just full disclosure, I'm just trying to get through to chapter 19, which is the promised land. Anybody with me? Amen. So just follow me. We're gonna get it, but it's not gonna be as deep. But I wanna give you a 30,000 foot perspective of a theological explanation of what's happening in this text or these two texts and what does it mean for our life today? Uh, and I asked you this week to go read chapters eight and nine for yourself and ask yourself the question like, how would I preach this passage? How many people did that? Okay, three of us. Thanks for not, <laughs> for the honesty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you're like, I'm not even going to bother with that. I already know. But no, no. Here's what I want to do before we continue on. Let me just give you the lens through which I am viewing the book. And by the way, if you did not listen to the first two sermons of this series, just encourage you to go back and just at least those two, because this is the lens I view the whole book. And again, you don't have to agree with me, and, that, and that's fine. In fact, I even heard, again, I'm getting on rabbit trails, I should, but I even heard this week, hey, listen, you know, there's life groups that are taking apart your sermon and teaching something different. And I'm like, okay, as long as it's not heresy, you know, and I hear it, I, I want you wrestling. I don't want you to be a cookie cut out of me. By the way, that's a cult, right? When the, if you're at a church, by the way, and the pastor says, you believe my way or the highway, that's a cult, run, amen? Like you need to study the book for yourself because at the end of time, you're gonna give an account for Jesus and I ain't gonna be there with you, right? Well, Pastor Robbie said that. He's gonna say, no, wh what do you believe, amen? So you gotta believe, what you, but this is where I'm at, okay? So here's the lens, just follow me. I believe after studying this book for a year and a half now, I, again, could be wrong, but I don't think so, again, in my mind. Hopefully I'm not wrong. You know, Martin Luther used to say, I'm right 95% of the time in my theology and wrong five. I just don't know what... 5% I'm wrong. But anyway, so, <laughs> okay. So here's the lens. Revelation, I think, portrays the seals, one set of judgments, the trumpets, another set of jump, tr judgments, seven of them, and the bowls, another set of judgments, not as a chronological roadmap to the end, but as a recapitulation or a retelling of the same plagues and judgment. Here's how I believe it. The first, the first set of seals is mirrored by the second set of trumpets, which is mirrored by the second set of bowls. So think of it this way, three sets of seven, which is the judgment of God against the nation of Israel who rejected the Messiah. That's what I think's happened. Now we learned that last week that I believe most of the tribulation, just kind of put you at ease, has already happened in the destruction of the temple leading up to AD 70. And here's a cool little insight. I don't have time to do it. I could have done it without time. We can't do it. But here's what you do. Take all of the trumpets and the bowls and then go compare them to Josephus, a first century historian, and watch how everything already happened. Mind-blowing. I'm gonna give you a couple today, but that's a mind-blowing exercise. But I wanna give you the theme. Write this down. If you get nothing else, Long Hollow, if you're with us online, write this down. This is the theme of this section. Here's the theme. If you cover sin in your life, God will uncover it, okay? 
May not be today, but one day he will uncover. And, and it always happens at the worst possible time. So if we cover, if we diminish, if we rationalize, minimize, justify our sin, which we are tempted to do, one day God's gonna uncover it or reveal it, if not in this life, at judgment. But here's the beautiful thing. Here's the encouraging thing. If we confess our sin by uncovering it to God, the Bible promises that God will cover our sin with the blood of his son and cleanse us from all iniquity. I don't know about you, that's good news, amen? That's good news today. Now, turn with me. Yeah, we can clap for uh, that because judgment's coming, so we need to clap now. <laughs> but serious. Okay, uh, before you get nervous, the first section of chapter eight is the seventh trump, uh, seal. We'll get to that later. Don't get nervous. We're gonna pick up verse six. Revelation chapter eight, verse six, one verse. You can do your homework and read the rest. But this is the one verse, and I'm gonna show you what's happening here. Revelation chapter eight, verse six, we like to say word. If you're there, say word. word. Okay, the word of the Lord. And God sent the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. I wanna show you who's in control of these angels and the trumpets and the wrath and the judgment. The first insight we see from this passage is that God's response, and it's the whole chapter, God's, write this down, God's response to sin is judgment. It has to be. For him to be a just God, he has to judge sin, right? Now, I said earlier, you can divide the seals, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls into parallel sections. Let me show you this. You may wanna take a picture of it, but uh, is this it, Robert? No, didn't get it updated, okay. But it's on the screen, so we made headway. Last time it was over there. Okay, good. Let me just show you how this works. Can I, can I draw on the screen? Okay, yes, good. Okay, here we go, here we go. Let me just show you how this works. Uh, there were supposed to be dividers, but you can do it in your, in, in your notes. There are three sections, you're gonna love this, of even these sections, okay? So these four are section one, these two are section two, and this is section three. How is it divided? They're all the same. The first four have to do with God's judgment directed at earth. Just go back and read it. The grass, the land, the hail, the blood, the sea. The last two, or the, the, the second uh, set of five and six is the second set of judgments, which is actually directed to the people. It comes individually. And then the final one, which by the way, there's no accident, it's three sets of three, which is, of, of a list of seven, seven, so you see all the numbers here. But the, the seventh one, the final one, is reserved for the return of Jesus at the end of time. And I mentioned that to understand this book, we don't read it like many of us were taught with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper or our Twitter feed in the other. That's not how you read Revelation. The way you read Revelation is the way the first century church did, with the Bible in one hand and the Old Testament scrolls in the other. See, in order for them to understand what was happening in the present reality, they didn't have to look forward to some future sci-fi event in the distant future. They had to look back to the way God has already acted in history. And would you know the source, you're gonna love that. In fact, when I, when I found this, this is unbelievable. The source material for John writing Revelation comes predominantly from an Old Testament section of scripture in the Torah. So I, I'll let you, just kind of a pop quiz. I want you to guess, where does John get all of his background paradigm from to write about the trumpets and the bowls particularly? Guess where he gets it from, take a guess. What narrative of the Old Testament? Exodus. Ezekiel's a great guess. Exodus, where at in Exodus, Justin, where you know? Uh, the, the plagues. That's it, the plagues. Get this man an ice cream sandwich right now, <laughs> right now. That is it, ding, 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 you got it. Okay, this is what John does. John, this is crazy, which is God. John takes the plagues of Egypt and retells them in the trumpets. You say, I don't know if I agree with you. I'm glad, I'm glad you are, are scrapped to it. Let me show you, let me show you from scripture, okay, where we are. You might wanna take a picture of, of this one. This is the connection between the trumpets and the bowls, and then I'm gonna show you the connection between the trumpets and the plagues. Real quick, just to show you. Seven trumpets, hail, fire, destruction. 
you have loathsome sores on the human on the earth, okay, a, a, a disease. Number two, sea life dies from blood. Number two, the second bowl, sea life dies from blood. The third trumpet, rivers and springs poison. Third bowl, rivers and springs turn to blood. Number four, stellar bodies afflicted on the earth, sun scorches men. Number five, the abyss open, it's all darkness. Number five, the beasts in the kingdom, all dark. You see the point here. Number six, angels at the Euphrates unleash an army against men. Number six, bowl. I mean, it's literally the same thing. Euphrates dries up allowing the kings to assemble for Armageddon. Number seven, kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of Christ. Number seven, the nations fall, God remembers their evil. You take a picture of, of that. But that's not what I wanna show you. This is the one that got me, okay? This is the one that got me, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you. Some of you are gonna say, well, I, that, that was here the whole time. The pr here's the problem. When your lens is looking for future events, you can find them. I can find them. I mean, I, I, I can do, Pastor, you know, we could do mental exegetical. I can do exegesis to find. But if you're looking to the past, it's in plain sight. Notice this. First trumpet, earth hits with hail, fire, and blood. Watch this. The first uh, in the plagues, the sixth plague was boils and the seventh plague was hails. Why? Because this is sores and that's hail. Same. Number two, the second trumpet, a third of the sea turned to blood and a third of the, half of the creatures die. What is the, what is the first plague of the, uh, in Egypt? The water turns to what? Same thing. Number three, you have the same thing. The water is embittered by, uh, by wormwood, it turns to blood. Number four, a third of the sun, moon, stars darken. Number nine, the ninth plague, what happens? God turns the whole world black. In case you forgot it, God said, let me give you a softball. Number five, do we have five up there? Locust released on the earth. What was the eighth plague? Locusts released on the earth. We don't have this because I don't have time to get in trouble for the parking. But here's the deal. You get the point. You get the point. The point of John, I know that's a lot. You're like, man, that's a big history lesson. Here's the point. The point is John took the plagues and retold them with trumpets. Now, the question is, why? Why would he do that? And the answer is, we have to go back to ask the question, why were the plagues sent in the first place? Why would God send plagues to Egypt and Pharaoh? Three reasons, write these down. Number one is this. God wanted to show and reveal that Pharaoh and the Egyptians had a hard heart toward him. They rejected God. Number two, this is the second one, God sent judgment through the plagues for sin. That's an easy one, right? And here's the third one. The third one is God is showing that his glory transcends every other false God in the world. God is showing that he is God and they are not, amen? That I'm in control and they are not. And he is demonstrating his authority. Now, I said this early on, but chapters six through 18, just kind of warn you, are the hardest sections, I would say, in the entire Bible to read. Anybody, know, anybody agree with that? It, it, it's hard to read. But here's what God's showing us. He's showing us a couple of things. Number one is this. When you see like the plagues and the destruction and the hail and the fire and the blood, here's what we're witnessing. We're witnessing how much God hates sin and at the same time, how flippant we are as humans towards sin. We're seeing a holy God, how much he hates sin, but, but, but how, how much we minimize and tolerate and justify sin. You, you gotta realize, this whole section, because you read this, you're like, man, this is an angry God. No, it's a just God who has to punish sin in order to be just. And punishing sin means God has a standard. When you fall short and break the standard, there has to be consequences. Now, the, the temptation at this point, and I hear this from young people, They'll say, well, why do we even need God? Why do I even need a book? I don't need no book. I don't need a book to tell, right? I don't need a bunch of laws to tell me how to live. I can do what's right in my own eyes apart from anyone telling me. Anybody heard this before? I don't need, I don't need you telling me how to live my life. I was listening to a debate, and you probably uh, have seen this, some of you, years ago with an apologist uh, at a college university, and they were debating moral subjective reasoning, which is just a technical phrase that means moral uh, just is what's right or wrong, subjective meaning you can figure it out, your, your truth's good for you, my truth's good for me, and we don't have the same 
subjective. And then reasoning is we could figure it out alone. Basically, I don't need you telling me what to do. I can figure it out and do the right thing every time. That's what it is. So they were debating and this uh, uh, student who came up pretty well-dressed and so he was pretty eloquent and he came up and he said, I've got a question to ask you. And the apologist said, go ahead. And he said, let's go ahead. I, I, have, the, I have the actual response. Let's go ahead and put Christianity and biblical examples aside. All night you've been grappling with what is right and what is wrong and whether or not people will do the right thing by themselves apart from God's law. Well, my question is this, and he's really pointed when he says this, why are you so afraid of subjective moral reasoning? He asked him. Do you think that we as humans are just gonna go out and start raping people and pillaging because we don't have a book to tell us what to do? Are you afraid of that, he says? Because I'm not. And he finishes and says, because it's not gonna happen. So the apologist slowly comes up after he's finished his question at the mic and he simply asks one question. He said, can I ask you a question? Do you lock your doors at night? Let me ask you, do you lock your doors at night? So you're saying right away, I don't trust the moral subjective reasoning of the people that live even in my own town. See, we know we can't stop people from doing wrong. We can't trust people to do what's right in their own eyes. Why? Because someone could say, well, I killed him because I felt like it was the right thing. Don't tell me what's right or wrong. It was right for me. See where I'm going? Why did you rape this person? Because that's my, des this is the way I'm made. You heard this before. This is the way I'm made so I should act or I can act this way. Young people specifically, listen to me. Without God's holy law, we have no guiding principle to take us anywhere. Let me say it this way. Life without law is unlivable, okay? Life without God's law is unlivable. God's law is, God knew, like you gotta remember, the law for the first century uh, believers and even Old Testament saints was a gift. It was life. It was, it was parameters to, to live by. Now we don't look at the law that way, and I know that because nobody got up this morning and drove down Long Hollow Pike and, and said, man, I cannot wait to drive 35 miles an hour to church today. This is awesome, right? I wanna <laughs> obey these laws. Nobody does it, right? So we have to shift our perspective. See, God's judgment for punishing sin proves that he's a just God. And here's the, here's the alteration that has to happen. We have to start viewing God's law, his rule, his guidance, his promises, not as, listen, not as restrictions to our happiness. We need to look at God's law as expressions of his love for us. See, parents, you know this, right? The kids, listen up. The reason mom and dad have so many rules is not to hurt you or cripple or put a dampen or dampen your, your fun or your happiness. It's because they love you. Parents, we know this. Like rules are expressions of a mom or dad's love. And for God to be a just God, he cannot turn, listen, he can't turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to wickedness and blasphemy. And you know that, I mean, listen, just because we don't have a book to, like you don't carry this around every day. Let me see, hold on, I'm in a situation. Let me see what happens here. No, you know right or wrong because the Bible says it's written on your what? Heart. It's written on our conscience. Which is why many of you sat down last week to watch the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. Only to be disgusted by what was portrayed, amen? I mean, if you didn't see it, I, I, you probably did, but during the parade, drag queens sat around a table depicting the Lord's Supper. Now they tried to backpedal and say, this was no, we were, to, we were trying to share the Dionysus painting from the 17th, 18th century, a bunch of hogwash in my opinion, with all due respect. They literally mocked God. And this grotesque mockery of the Lord's Supper, friends, I'm just gonna call it what it is. It is blasphemy, blaspheming God. See, there's a, listen, let me just say this. I know I'm gonna get in trouble for going on, but I, I think I need to say that. 
The reason they attacked Jesus and God and not, you'll never see them attacking Islam or, or Muhammad or Hare Krishna or Buddhism or Buddha, why? Because they are dead. They're only gonna attack God and Jesus because he's alive today. I mean, he's the only threat to the kingdom of this world. That's why, that's why. And, and if you didn't catch it, let me share with you the subtle agenda items they were pushing. I wanna just call these out. Here's what they were pushing. What we witnessed, number one, was not art and creativity as it was couched by those people who presented it. It was not art and creativity. It was an expression of human depravity and satanic warfare. That's what that is. Friends, listen, we are seeing before our eyes, I mean, this is, a, this is like, a, this is like a, a, a case study for Christians. We are seeing before our eyes the very real spiritual war that's happening behind the scenes with sinful men and sinful women hating and attacking a holy God. And if you don't believe me, and I say this, person, man, you're overstepping, I, I, don't, I think that's too much. If you don't believe that, I say this with love, brother Christian, Brother, sister, you are incredibly naive. You're incredibly naive. The world we live in hates everything about Jesus and everybody who follows him. If we think in the days ahead that the world is gonna let us keep singing songs in here and raising hands freely and freedom of speech and taking prisoners from Satan's kingdom and bringing them up, if you think they're gonna let us do that without pushing back, we are sorely mistaken. That's what the world does. And here's, listen, this is what makes matters worse. I was gonna show you the video, I'll let you figure it out yourself. Go look it, up, look, it, look it up online. The first lady of America, the first lady, went online after the ceremony and said these words. I thought the ceremony was spectacular. What kind of, wor what kind of world are we living in today, right? You wanna know? It's the same world that they lived in in the first century in the Roman Empire. People always say, man, it's getting so bad today. Compared. I said, compared to what? Listen, when they start putting Christians lined on Long Hollow Pike on crosses, setting a, them ablaze down the street, and when they start lopping heads off for preaching against Jesus, then we can say it's like the Roman Empire. Friends, we don't hold a candle to them. I'm not minimizing today, but the reality is the world hates God. So what do we do? Okay, what do we do? Because I know some of you, I mean, let's get the pitchforks and the water pistols. We're gonna, we're gonna go to hell, we're gonna go after hell, right? Like we're going for it, right? What do we do, right? Uh, do we let's, go to, let's go to social media, that'll win, right? <laughs> it's a joke, by the way. Uh, by the way, this is a story you didn't hear on national news, and I'm gonna share it with you now. Within 24 hours after this Olympic debauchery, of his opening ceremony. I don't know if you heard, but, and go look it up. Fact check me all you want. I went and fact check it all week. I couldn't believe it, it's crazy. The entire power went out in Paris. Within 24 hours, you're gonna love this. Within 24 hours after the opening ceremony, all the power was out. The whole city was in darkness except one place and one building that had lights shining up. Go look it up. That place right there is the Church of Sacred Heart. It's a church that's lit up in the darkness. It's like God says, hey, you think I missed it? I got you. I, I, got, I, got, I got it. So that's the first thing. Here's the second agenda item. I don't wanna spend too long, but here's the second agenda item that that ceremony projected. The opening ceremony depicted the new alternate religion. Do you wanna know the alternate religion today? The sexual religion. Revolution. That's, the, young people, this is the alternate religion you're gonna be, because here's what this says. This says that people are defined by their sexuality and their gender. That's who you are. Your sexuality, that's all you are in a sense. And again, I preached a sermon series on this, but let me give you a quote that I think was helpful. Sam Alberry said this. He said, this is the temptation today. Our culture says to the world, your psychology, the way you think, what you believe, your psychology is your sexual identity, so let your body be conformed to your mind. 
Whereas the Bible says something opposite. Your body is your sexual identity. Let your mind be conformed to the Bible, to your body in a sense, right? Paul said it this way. Do not be, Romans 12, uh, 2, do not be conformed to the ways of the what? of the world. Don't listen to the TikTok trends of today. I don't care if he's got 2 million followers on YouTube. If it ain't in the Bible, it ain't right. That's what the word is saying. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the what? Word, right? Which means we got to get into the word, into the words to get sent to us, right? So how do we respond? Because I know we're ready. Like, okay, tell, tell us when. We we got you. We're gonna go after him, right? Here's how we respond. And again, I don't want to downplay this, but but our anger turns into anguish. Let me remind you. This is a great line Candy and I say a lot at home from time to time. Let me remind you: lost people act like lost people. The reason they act, see, if they knew Jesus the way we would, they would never blaspheme God but they are blind to their spiritual blindness. So our job is not to retaliate with anger and vitriol and hateful comments online and try to correct some, someone's faulty theology on Twitter, which by the way, that never worked, but, but that's not what we do. We don't pick up the sword. Instead, we point the finger to our slain lamb savior, Jesus Christ, who can take away any sin from the world. And our job as Christians is to share the good news with anybody and everybody around us. We fight, here's how we fight, by calling people to repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. Who warns you, brothers? The wrath of God is coming. And I know I know what you're thinking, man, it looks like we're losing ground. And golly, it looks like we're, we're retreating. It looks like we're shrinking back. Let me remind you how this book ends. Revelation 21 and 22 say there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth and King Jesus is coming back, not a savior like he did the first time, not gonna turn the cheek like he did the, the time around. Jesus is coming back as judge and king. And here's the thing we need to remember. You don't blaspheme God and get away with it. That's what this book is about. You don't mock God without consequences for your actions. And that's what that's what punishment is. Remember, punishment is God's judgment for sin, and that's how much he hates sin, which leads to the last point. I know you're saying, man, this is, this is a lot. Judgment, sin, <laughs> recompense. Here, here, here's the insight, like kind of a nugget around all this destruction, and that is, number two, our response to God's judgment always is repentance. It's always Repentance. Again, I don't have time to read the whole passage. I will read chapter nine, verse four, and I'll read 20 and 21. But let me just show you what's happening. In the midst of all of these attacks and, 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 and the trumpets, I think this is the fifth trumpet, they're all, you know, all Hades is breaking loose on earth. And then we see this little nugget. Verse four, they were told not the angels, not to harm the grass of the earth or the green plants or the trees, but only harm those people who do not have, here it is, God's seal, you know what that word is? Another word for mark, God's mark, which by the way, I know you're waiting with bated breath for chapter 13, when we find out what the mark of the, spoiler alert, it's not a barcode in the form of a tattoo on your hand, by the way. It's not the COVID vaccine uh, virus vaccine. <laughs> Some of you are like, there's a computer chip in the virus, don't take, I mean, in the vaccine. I'm like, wow. But anyway, bizarre stuff. But anyway, it's, it's, it's the way of life. I'll give you a little hint. It's a way of life. So here's what he said. Anybody who has God's seal on their forehead is protected. So we see mercy in the midst of destruction and turmoil. We see mercy for those who repent and turn to God. But everybody doesn't do that. Here's the reality. Everybody won't turn. Look at the end of chapter nine. This is the sad reality. Verse 20, the rest of the people who live through the, through the tribulation in AD 70, the rest of them were not killed by the plagues did not repent of their works of their hands to stop worshiping demons. You would think they would have seen all that. No, demons and idols, they worship gold and silver, bronze, stone and wood, which they cannot see or hear or walk. And they did not, sobering, and they did not repent of their murders and their sorceries and their sexual immorality or their theft. So don't think worship idols means like carved images, 
that you manufacture out of a wood shop to put on a shelf. That's not what he's talking about. I mean, that could be part, but what he's talking about is bigger than that. He's talking about the worship of money and fortune. He's talking about the worship of accolades and achievements. He's talking about the worship of recognition and fame. Because that's what we do. We worship, and we worship people. We worship movements. We, we worship uh, the culture that teaches us to be angry and violent and commit murder and theft and steal and cheat. Why? Because everybody else is doing that. Friends, as believers, here's what we have to understand. The mark of our life is not a tattoo on a hand or a wrist. The mark of, your, of Christ on your life is the way we live. It's the way we live. And as believers, we should not act like the world. We should be walking upstream. We should be resisting the current of our current society, right? And God says, oh, I made you different in order to make a difference. Now, the true mark of a believer, you see it all through Revelation, is repentance. And this is the key, watch this. When I say repentant, repentance, a lot of you say, oh, I've already done that. I got saved, didn't I? I mean, I've already I've done that. And we think that repentance is a one-time thing of the past, but repentance, don't miss this, is the hallmark of the evidence to prove that you're a Christian. I would say this, a lot of people say, I don't know if I'm a Christian. When you sin, which you will, if you're on earth, when you sin, are you convicted of that sin? Which leads you to repentance. Here's how I know. When I was in the drug world for about three and a half years, the reason I know that the prayer I prayed years before was not genuine is because when I was in the drug world, I sinned and loved every minute of it. Now, I knew it was wrong because I didn't want to go to jail, but I wasn't convicted, wasn't confessing. I just didn't want to get caught. Here's what repentance is. There's three things in a sense. Number one is it's awareness that I am sinning, that I am doing something to displease a holy God. But number two, watch this, it's awareness and confession. See, confession is not just, well, I say it. You gotta say it. No, here's what confession means in the Greek. Confession means God says it's sin. I agree that it's sin. It's agreement. That's all confession is. Confession is agreeing with God about sin. But that doesn't stop there. So you acknowledge your sin. You're aware of it. You confess it to God. Here's the big one. And then you turn and you walk away from it. And don't go back. See, the reason some of you have not experience victory and sobriety is because you're living in unrepentant sin. Every night you go to bed and say, I'm never gonna do this again. I'm not gonna watch this again. I'm not gonna text this person again. I'm not gonna engage in this conversation again. And then the next day, you're back to it. You know, I know you did that because I, I used to do that. I'll never do drugs again. I'll never drink again. And I meant it. But the next day, I was back in it. I, I know at this point, you probably say, man, I, I'm a little uncomfortable. I mean, all this talk about wrath and judgment and condemnation. And normally, listen, normally when you hear a message like this and you kind of get put on your heels when you're starting to hear about judgment and sin, the, the natural tendency is to point the finger and avert and distract. Like, hey, yeah, I may be bad, but boy, I'm not as bad as, <laughs> you see my cousin? I mean, he's bad, right? Anybody, everybody do this for? Like, like we say, I'm not bad. He's, I was at the gym years ago, I remember I was a, was a new believer for like two months. And back then when I was a new believer, I was so zealous evangelistically that I was sharing Christ with the telephone poles. I mean, you know I mean? You're like anything, the cart rack at Walmart, you know, do you know, you know I mean, like, all jokes, but I mean, I was passionate. And uh, I'd go to the gym and I was sharing Christ with this guy and this girl behind the counter. And I'm just like, hey, here's the gospel. Jesus is the only way. There's no other way to God through Jesus, God's son. And he pushes back and says, well, let me get this straight. If you really believe that Jesus is the only way and there's no other way, then what happens to the innocent man on a remote island somewhere in the world who never hears about Jesus? Does he go to heaven? Have you heard this question before? Yeah, what happens to an innocent man on an island, remote island, never hear? And, and, I, and I will agree, that is a valid question and it's a good question. But at the core of that question, you have to wonder, what is the question behind the question? And I believe the question behind the question reveals what that person or you, if you're asking that question, it reveals your belief about God and humanity. Follow me. Because if you're saying there is a way for a good man in Africa or an innocent island or, or innocent man in Africa or, or an island to come to faith apart from Jesus, what you're saying at the core is that you believe people are genuine, generally good. They're generally, generally good, right? 
Unfortunately, the great philosopher Luke Bryan had it wrong when he sang, all pe most people are good, right? I, lo I love Luke, but with all due respect, that's not true. According to the Bible, everybody's not good. And by the way, we should never get our theology from the big 98 or country music, right? <laughs> as good as Morgan is, we love Morgan, but, you know. But anyway, uh, according to a recent Gallup poll, which is really surprising, a Gallup poll search, uh, surveyed the church, they found out that 60% of professing evangelicals said they believed people were generally good. And here's what happens. You may think that too. I think people are generally good. The reason is we think people are generally good because we compare people to, we compare ourselves to other people lesser than us, right? We always compare ourselves to a standard less than perfection, right? We'll say, well, compared to my drunken uncle, y'all know Uncle Jack, golly, I'm way better than him, right? I may not be a good dad, but I'm better than the neighbor down the street. Or you compare yourself to the womanizing employee uh, at the office. Or you compare yourself to the classmate at school. At least I don't curse as much as Mike at school, right? Or at least I, didn't che I don't cheat as much as Sally who's six days. And so we compare ourselves to kind of a lesser than straw man, but then we can do it in the church. Well, at least I go to church more than my family. You know, I'm here more. Or I'm in a D group or a life group. What about you? By the way, are you in a, no, <laughs> but seriously, no, but, but that's what we do. We compare ourselves to someone that we're better than. Here's the question. Stop comparing yourself to goodness and let's compare yourself to holiness. That's the line. Don't ever say, do you think he's good? Everybody could be good from time to time. Listen, you can always hit a straight lick with a crooked stick every now and then, okay? The question is, are you holy? That's the standard. When you and I compare ourselves to Jesus, perfection in righteousness, we fall short. Which is why the Bible says, there's no one righteous, no, not one. No one understands. They've altogether become meaningless. They've turned away. There is no one righteous, no, not what? One. Do you know what that word one means in the Greek? It's an interesting word. It means one. No one, right? Like nobody is good. For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, here's the thing you gotta understand, because you hear hell and death and separation and fire and gnashing of teeth. Forget all that for a moment. Put that aside. We're gonna answer the question, and then I'm gonna tell you what hell is, because I know what you're saying. I'm on the edge of my seat. What happens to the innocent man on a remote island who never hears about Jesus? Does he go to heaven, right? Who wants to know the answer to that? Okay, four of us. I want to know the answer. Here's the answer. The answer is, does the innocent man on the remote island who never heard about Jesus go to heaven? The answer is yes. Yeah. He goes to heaven. Here's the problem. There is no innocent man on a remote island who knows, who doesn't know about Jesus. There's only a sinful man who was born into sin, who is desperately in need of a savior, just like there's no innocent man or woman in this church or in this country or in this community or on this planet who is free from sin? See, here's the better question. The question is not what happens to that man. The question is this, where is the sinful man or woman who is sitting in my seat going for eternity? I'm talking about your seat. That's the question. Because we always wanna say, what about that? No, no, put that aside. Forget that for a moment. Where are you going when you stand before a holy God? See, I told you earlier, hell is a place, not, not just gnashing and fire and, and teeth and separation. Hell is a place, don't miss this, where for those on earth who live the life of rebellion and rejection against God, they finally get their wish. Because here's what they said on earth. God, it's a lifelong prayer. Leave me alone. We don't want you in the Olympics. We don't want you in the ceremony. We don't, and God, and listen, at the end of life, here's what God said. He said, brother, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grant that request. I'm gonna answer that request. Go to hell. That's what it is. But here's the good news of the gospel. John wrote an epistle, and in the first epistle, in chapter one, verses eight and nine, here's what he said. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the first thing is awareness. 
The second thing is confession. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of all of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the point, and I wanna close with this. If you cover sin, God will uncover it. Maybe not today, but one day he will. And it always comes at the most inopportune time of life. But if we ask and confess God, and we can confess it and we uncover our sin, God covers it with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and forgives us of all unrighteousness. Father, I pray right now, as we go to you in prayer, I know we come with heavy hearts because I know in a room this size, God, there are some who are living right now in unrepentant sin. And they have concealed and they have justified and they have minimized and they have rationalized their sin and they have said it's not a big deal. And God, they know, they know it's sin. And I'm gonna ask right now, they confess that and you cover it with the blood of your son. God, for your glory and your honor, we pray you do it in a way where you get the glory. We ask it in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said,